Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's great to have you all here today. Um, I hope that the weather wherever you are is not too, too severe. I know there's here in Athens County and other areas, there's some wild weather moving through. So I hope you and yours are safe. I am Neil Romanowski, Dean of University Libraries, and it's my pleasure to welcome you all to this afternoon's panel discussion, Publishing for Impact, Informing Through Open Access. I'm joined today by Dr. Tom Gibbs, Dr. Evan Harris, and Dr. Danielle Feeney, um, who will be sharing their views on open access publishing, scholarship, and access to research in the journal literature for practitioners of various types. Um, I'm going to ask our panelists to introduce themselves in just a moment, but before I do that, uh, there's some housekeeping and practical notes about our session today on Microsoft Teams. Uh, that I just wanted to share. I think Jen Harvey, our events coordinator, is going to share a slide with some information on it. Thank you, Jen. So as you see on this slide, um, please keep your microphones muted until you're asked to unmute. Um, you can share through the chat um, throughout the session, pop your questions in there. Um, you can use your the hand raise reaction to notify speakers if you want to share or engage without interrupting. Uh, like it says here, we're keen to hear your questions, so don't hesitate to ask. Um, and you could also use the various reaction buttons listed there. And live captioning um, for enhanced accessibility is available through that um, three dot icon at the top. And uh, uh, there's a turn on live captions box um, that's highlighted here on the slide as well. So thank you, Jen. Um, we are recording the session this afternoon as well, just so you're all aware of that. And uh, again, thank you all very much for being here. Uh, so I'm now, uh, and I just want to say, you know, well, I'll be asking some questions of our panelists, but we're going to have ample time at the end also to take any questions that that come to mind. Um, but I'd now like to um, ask our panelists to introduce themselves by saying uh, a bit about their roles, their work, and uh, what it is about open access and its impact on practitioners. Uh, just a you know, word or two, a uh, thought that, that brings you to the panel today. So um, I will just go around my screen here and start with uh, Danielle. Awesome, thank you. Uh, my name is Danielle Feeney and I am a assistant professor of instruction in special education. I work in the Patton College of Education um, at Ohio University and I most frequently work with pre-service teachers who want to teach students with disabilities and so preparing them to go into the field to do that. Um, I have kind of a mixed experience with open access um, especially because I am instructional faculty and I am not in a tenure track line. So my primary goal is not research based. It is teaching. However, that brings a really important piece of open access because when I do want to publish at my own will, um, I do have that option. But also really thinking about um, as someone who's partnering with schools and districts and educators, um, what their access to research looks like. And so I kind of have that multiple perspective that I work with because I am in a teaching position. Thanks so much, Danielle. Um, next, I will go to Evan. Thanks. My name is uh, Evan Harris. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Social Work, um, which is in the College of Health Sciences and Professions. Um, I think I come to open access because I really do see it as a social justice issue. So I think not only are we um, sort of accessing clients and for us it's often uh, vulnerable people that we're doing for research uh, participants so we're accessing these people um, we're sort of taking something from them and then if we're publishing it behind a paywall then we're sort of just keeping it within the ivory tower and not giving access to it um, so i really feel like not only do i need to make sure that that research is available for them to use but also because we are in a practice field then i want to make sure that all of our social workers ha then have um, access to that evidence-based um, sort of practice and research that's out there. Great, thank you, Evan. And uh, Tom. Hi, uh, Tom Gibbs, currently the superintendent of the Athens City School District. I've been with Athens City for about nine years. This is my 17th year as a school superintendent, my 31st year in uh, public education in the state of Ohio. Um, I come to open access. I think, Neil, you and I had a conversation uh, a little over a year ago 
uh, where I was kind of lamenting to you this uh, lack of ability for folks in positions like mine to easily, um, you know, we're always encouraged to make research-based decisions, but we oftentimes don't have uh, easy access to uh, current research. And so, uh, to me, it's that's kind of an interesting uh, uh, situation that I've been in for many years. And until recently, I taught adjunct uh, with Ohio University up until a few years ago. And so, I did have that access as a, a part-time employee. But when I stopped doing that, my access also stopped. And so now I have a more limited access to be able to, to do that background research um, that's so important to the decisions that, that we make. Great, thank you, Tom. Uh, thank you everyone for those intros. I'm really appreciative of your time and perspectives today and, and I'm really looking forward to our conversation. Um, I thought I'd start off by offering a definition of open access uh, to anybody joining today uh, for whom the, the concept may be new. And I'm going to use a definition that's put forward by SPARC, um, which is the Scholarly Publishing and Academic Resources Coalition, which the OU Libraries is a, um, is a member of. So the SPARC definition of open access, which I'll just call OA probably from here on out, is uh, OA is the free, immediate, online availability of research articles coupled with the rights to use uh, those articles fully in the digital environment. OA ensures that anyone can use these results or research to turn ideas into industries and breakthroughs into better lives. Um, so when I look at that definition, uh, to me, you know, the words free, online, and use by anyone jump out at me. Because uh, at its core, I, I think publishing open access means that information is moved from behind a paywall and into the realm of free public access. And that broadens the availability of research uh, beyond those who have affiliations with uni universities or libraries, et cetera. Uh, and it makes it more broadly available for the public good. However, uh, publishing open access isn't free. Uh, publishers still have costs associated with the review and the acceptance and the editing and the dissemination of any publication um, and authors and libraries and other entities often pay uh, thousands of dollars uh, to cover those fees um, in the case of authors um, the, through article processing charges or APCs as they're often referred to uh, or in the case of libraries uh, changes to the subscription models that we have to content from those publishers which is a complex under undertaking uh, to say the least. So, so all that being said, it's, it's unquestionable that practitioners of various types from uh, teachers to healthcare workers, social workers, many others, often require access to the latest research and evidence in their fields in order to, to, to stay current, um, to retain or to achieve accreditation in some cases and to best serve the populations and advance their work. Um, and so, it, the good news is that more content than ever before is being made available open, uh, but there is still much, the majority of which actually, um, of the research literature still lies behind paywalls and uh, remains un unavailable to or unfeasible uh, for many practitioners to access for the purposes of furthering their work and their impact. So it's some of those tensions that today uh, we're going to be exploring in conversation with our panelists. So without further ado, I'm going to jump into our questions here. Um, and again, I, I invite our panelists to also ask questions of one another as we move through. Please do feel free to pop your questions into the chat as we as we move along and uh, looking forward to the conversation. So to start us off, um, the word impact has multiple definitions within the context of scholarly publishing and in relation to open access. On one hand, um, there are terms we often talk about things like impact factor related to scholarly metrics and um, that's used to judge the value of scholarly publications in a particular field. But on the other hand, impact also describes how continuing education and professional development, which promote professional impact for practitioners, um, are informed by open access to research in, in journal and other kinds of literature. So uh, I'm just going to ask, could each of you talk a bit about how you juggle those two perspectives, publishing for impact uh, and the impact of publishing models um, and information in, uh, access in your own professional lives? 
So I will start uh, well, in the same order here. I'll start with uh, Danielle. Absolutely. Um, for for me, the first one talking about impact factor um, is a little bit different because, like I said, I am in a teaching role, and so um, where this often indicates quality of a journal or potentially um, how prestigious it is, right? Um, I definitely have those considerations when I look to do the publishing when I have time or do that research. Um, for me specifically, as someone who is in an instructional line but wants to or enjoys writing and publishing and kind of having that impact in the other sense um, out there, it is important for me to also consider the effect that where I publish um, has on my access to tenure track positions or different roles that I want. And so um, often thinking about if I wanted to move the type of position I'm in, I want to show that I can write and publish for quality journals, um, that I can have that greater impact and show prestige on my CV um, because they are associated with that in academia. Um, and so that's one consideration that I have. So it's not just what does it look like for me, but how does it help me move throughout um, different positions or whether it's promotion or for those who obtain tenure. Um, so that's something I have to consider if I want to apply and ever be in one of those positions. I think currently a really big part of the other hand of it is the other type of impact that you were describing um, and really thinking about who can engage with the literature, the publications, who can access it. Um, and it's really critical for me as someone who's supporting educators in school districts that they have access. Um, kind of like Dr. Gibbs was talking about earlier, there's a big disconnect, right? If you don't have access to what's going on um, in the research, you can't implement that, but there's that expectation to, and how are you supposed to if you don't have access? So it's really important for me as someone who wants to support schools um, and districts to make sure that I, I do my due diligence in making it accessible or trying to consider those options. Um, so that's where a big focus is for me. So I have to juggle it that way between my professional life and my own teaching values and you know what I believe teaching and research should entail, which is you know kind of like more widely getting that to others so they can apply it, um, those who are actually doing that work out in the field. Thank you. Evan, what about you? Yeah, I mean, I think um, to sort of Danielle's point, I think when I when I was on the job market looking, I think that it was really important for me to kind of think about that when I'm applying for jobs and and have a better understanding of what the PNT process looks like within various programs um, and to understand what that expectation is. So then if they need me to be in certain journals that have certain impact factors um, and those type of things for me, um, it I was more so having conversations with um, during interviews to say this is who I am. I believe strongly in open access. Um, I prefer wholeheartedly to always publish in gold um, OA journals. Um, if not, I'm still always going to have some green OA to have some my my preprint self archived or something. And that's sort of what was important for me. So when I know that when I talked um, here at OU and I said I'm interested in this, is that going to be a problem for me to get um, promoted and to get tenure if I'm planning on um, publishing in, in um, gold OA journals? And they said no. And so for me, I knew that like I understand that different Carnegie kind of um, classifications and that different programs really feel like based on having higher rankings, then they need to have faculty that are publishing in certain journal journals. So I understand it. Um, but again, to like Danielle's point that I feel like with what we're doing overall, if I'm a licensed social worker, if this is what I'm supposed to do with my whole career and what I'm supposed to then be imparting with these students that are coming through, then these are our social work values is that information should be accessible for everyone. Um, and so then it's not something that I feel like, I feel like maybe it's an ethical issue for me um, to not be paying attention to that and not um, doing everything that I can to free up that information and to make it available to people um, to just address some of the larger issues that we have. So um, it is super important when it comes to the job market, um, but for me, I just felt like if that was the priority, it just wasn't the job for me. 
Um, and so I, I'm thankful to be in a place here to where um, publishing in, in gold OA journals is really sort of embraced um, and not just accepted, but I feel like championed in ways that um, makes it feel like it's a good fit for me. Thanks, Evan. And I'm just going to pop into the chat here a link to um, a subject guide we have at the library is about open access and it. And there's a table in there that breaks down green and gold and those kinds of things. So our audience members can can check that out. But um, I'm appreciative to you both for raising this issue about academic job postings and because we always you always see in those for those faculty spots um, information about high impact journals, right? And so it's really great to get that insight, um, Evan, into conversations around promotion and tenure during the interview process for for faculty members who who have this um, drive to make research more open. Uh, Tom, what about you? Uh, uh, firstly, I feel really underqualified uh, this afternoon to be part of this conversation because Danielle and Evan just uh, spoke very eloquently on this. Um, for school superintendents, there really is no expectation of, of publishing. Um, again, there's a lot of talk about making, uh, you know, informed research based uh, decisions, but uh, often uh, people in administrative positions don't have easy access to that information. And and my concern and, and my interest in this topic is, is that that in the absence of having um, easy access, what folks do is they go to Google, right? Uh, they just search the internet. Um, and I'll just use an example or two, if you don't mind, of, of things that have happened in the last year that impact my work that has to do with this topic. Um, COVID, you know, everyone has uh, their, their perceptions of how schools should have responded, when we should have reopened, what our protocols should have been, when we should have stopped masking, whether we should have stopped masking. Uh, and these are all really um, uh, uh, topics that have had a lot of emotion behind them as well. And when you go out and you, you Google, you know, masking, uh, the science behind masking, any of these topics, um, you'll get thousands and thousands of things that come up. And the the uh, public media, so uh, the, the uh, uh, television stations, newspapers, publishers of that nature, they've made all of these articles free. So what ends up happening is, is I end up getting emails and, and, and uh, um, requests from parents, from community members. Uh, oftentimes people who have uh, an incredible education themselves, uh, uh, more prestigious than my own, right? Who, who will say, look, I want you to make this decision and this is why, and they'll attach these, these articles or this evidence and those articles or evidence really are opinion pieces. Uh, they're unvetted. They're uh, or they refer to a research article. And as you know, those of us in the room know, I can refer to a research article, but draw my own conclusion that maybe was not the conclusion of the person who did the original research. And so, if I don't have the access then to go to that original research and check it for myself, that really places me at a disadvantage. Um, so as a as a practitioner, this is something that is uh, is very real when you talk about impact, because it's not just um, it's not just having the ability to access the information myself to make good decisions, but in a in a position of community trust, uh, where I'm serving such a broad range of people, it's also the information that I get from those very families that I serve and to what level I can um, kind of review, uh, fact check, um, and then use that information appropriately to make decisions on behalf of the, the children and families of, of the district that I serve. I think I just want to extend from that quickly. I think you bring up a really good point about COVID, and I think not just about protocols and what schools should be doing, but um, it goes the same for teaching practices, right? Um, as soon as COVID hit and we had to, what was the term real, using pivot online and everything, I think it's important to think about, no one originally knew what to do. We hadn't been in those situations, right? So researchers jumped into the field, started some research, and throughout the time of COVID have been conducting research about best practices for online teaching, online 
um, behavior management, whatever it is, and how to do these things, and have been putting those articles out. And some of them have taken priority um, because we need it right now. Um, it's difficult though when you know, especially as someone who has access, that all of this work is being done, but it's behind a paywall and the people who need it can't access it. Um, so like you were saying, there is options to go to Google or you know, in our field, it's Teachers Pay Teachers or Pinterest, and that's really problematic for yeah. so many reasons, but they don't have access oftentimes to the new research that we're doing to help schools, right? And so there's this really big backwardsness. I don't know about that word, but like about it <laughs> and thinking like we have good intentions, but that is not being followed through with the impact that's happening on the other side, right? There's this huge disconnect. So I think that's a great point that you bring up. Well, since we're since we're on the topic of access specifically, it uh, kind of leads nicely into the next question, which is um, how do you think practitioners in your field typically do find and access the latest and most up to date uh, journal articles and other uh, materials for in, for impact in their practice. So, you know, some examples you mentioned Google, you know, public libraries. Um, and so I'm just wondering if you could each talk a little bit about that. I know, Tom, you already you spoke a bit about this um, already, but um, if you had some additional thoughts about where where do people go? Where does a practitioner go when faced with not having this kind of access to the current literature? Um, Tom, if it's, all, if it's all right, I'll just start with you again. Yeah, I mean, uh, firstly, I think because there hasn't been access, uh, we, I don't know if this makes sense, but you know, you, you get into the uh, uh, habits of your work, right? So, um, and those habits of work are based on what your, what your access to various tools and technologies and, and information are. Well, if you've been in the business for me, you know, over 30 years, never in my career have I had open access to that information. So most people in who are who are in the field and have been in the field of education for a long time, um, oftentimes just don't even look, right? That's not a habit of practice for them. Uh, whereas for a college professor who's having to publish in order to get tenure, and that is a habit of practice uh, uh, for them for their daily work. Um, so I do have some concern with with uh, open access more broadly, just in regards to then how do you help people to to build that you know that that practice of going out looking. That being said, there are a lot of teachers who they they read books, often recommended by a professor they know or uh, you know a course that they took in graduate school, things like that. Uh, sometimes it's a New York Times bestseller list. Uh, uh, something that's you know more broadly um, uh, read in the general public. Um, oftentimes, folks will Google. Uh, Danielle brings up a very good point, which I was <laughs> I was actually going to bring up later, which is teachers pay teachers, which is so disappointing because if you if you've been on there or you've seen anything about it, some of this stuff is firstly maybe copyright copyrighted by other by someone else, and it's being illegally uh, provided. Um, other times, it's just people make stuff up. So it's not necessarily research based. There's no guarantee that it is. Um, so I'm sure we'll talk about this later, Neil, but one of my concerns about open access is the peer review process and how do you make sure that um, you know the information that is that is being uh, accessed is um, quality research and quality information. Sorry, I rambled a bit there. No, that was fine, and, and you really you bring up that this great point about habits of practice. I mean, and so if this if if there hasn't been this kind of access, you know, in a field for a long time, um, you know, maybe certain negative patterns become ossified because of that, you know, and, and built into uh, uh, ways of practice for some. Um, Evan, how about you? How, what about what is what does access look like for practitioners in your fields who are not affiliated with a, an, an institution like OU, for example? Yeah, I think that um, I think that the reality is is that practitioners face a lot of barriers when they're trying to access information, um, and I think maybe a disservice that we do is that we 
maybe spend a little bit of time, probably not as much as we should, but we spend a little bit of time of teaching them how to do research when you're in a program. So how to use the library resources. The, um, the libraries have resources that are set up. We even here at OU, we have specific guides for even our classes. So students can access that website and know exactly how to find information for this assignment. Um, and so they've got a lot of great resources there and they understand how to use these resources in this setting. Um, but we don't ha teach them what happens after you leave this space. Um, but we have those expectations on them that they are supposed to have um, be using evidence based practices, but we don't tell them how to find those out or we don't tell them about how to keep it, um, stay up on it. Um, so I think too, um, for sure students after they graduate are using Google for just general searches. Um, and I don't think now that things like ResearchGate is out there and there's some other research repositories that have more links into them, I think that if you're doing a Google search, you can maybe get access to better articles that are published OA because we're putting them out there in different places. So I think searching through Google is better now than it maybe has been in the past. Um, but still, just like Tom was saying, you have to have be discerning a little bit and try to figure out is, is this good research or bad research in a way that if you're getting something through the library, you have a little bit more comfort in believing that it's going to be good research because people who know what they're doing have made those decisions about what we have access to. Um, so I think it, it puts somebody in a position to where um, if, if they're not the strongest researchers as it is, maybe I don't understand these methods, but it seems like it got published somewhere. Um, so I think it is a little bit scary in those ways, kind of like what Tom is saying, um, that we kind of we don't prepare them to, to understand how to get access later and to understand maybe how to be discerning of that information. Um, but I think that sometimes I've had students who've contacted me afterwards to say, I need this article. Can you get it for me from the library? Um, but I think people will maybe do that for a year or two after graduation and then they think I probably shouldn't message my professor anymore. Um, but I think that they maybe also don't recognize that even if they find research that they can contact that author to see if that author can share with them um, either an author, author's copy or um, maybe a preprint and stuff. So I think maybe we recognize what some of these issues are for them. We probably need to, or I at least need to do better, I think in the classes of preparing them that you, you need to stay updated afterwards. Let, let us tell you how you do that once you're away from the university and all the resources that we have. Danielle. Yeah, I think, I mean, that got me thinking right now in that um, how do we kind of, like you're saying, prepare teachers or prepare whoever, the students, to to move and use this in the future. And it gets me thinking because we, we know that learning something for one semester or one year or whatever is not making you necessarily masterful in that. So you need to continue working on those skills, apply them, practice them. But once they leave and whether it's in our field, it's becoming first year teachers, what resources do they have to become masterful on their own, right? And if they can't access these things, then they can't refine their skills or see, you know, read up more about it or whatever it is. And so I think that's a really good point to bring up is how are we preparing them? Um, and how does that potentially stop their growth if they don't have access later on? And um, if they can't refine their skills, if they can't think about, oh, well, I learned this thing, but I don't have anything to reference and I only got to practice it under one mentor teacher. You know, how do I keep this going on my own when I don't have the resources to do so? Um, similarly, it's really important because I was, I was glad you asked Dr. Gibbs to go first on this one. Um, my initial response was, I'm worried that practitioners in the field of education don't have access or don't even find access. Um, and I didn't want that to be such a negative assumption, but I think that's the reality and I don't think it's due to lack of wanting it. Um, I do think it's from all the barriers and eventually um, even things like Google Scholar, if you click on the link and there's a paywall there, it still doesn't help you, right? And so thinking about how often people might be trying and we, we still aren't getting answers or they still aren't getting answers. Um, we have a lot of students in our classes who are learning things in class, going out to the field for field experiences and coming back and saying, well, what you taught us, we don't see happening. So like, are you, Sometimes it's been like, are you lying? Like, why did you teach me this thing if I'm not seeing it in practice, right? And they're like, but this is what they do. This is what I've taught or I'm being taught in the field. 
Um, and so often we have to be like, pause, right? Let's think about this because we aren't teaching you for there to be a disconnect, but there's a lack of access to those who are in the field to stay abreast of the topics that they need to and of their research to implement it. Um, also trying to encourage students, this is your time. You know, if you had an article you wanna share with them, do that and be that point of access for someone for a little bit. Um, but obviously then there's concerns, well, can I do that? I'm supposed to be learning from them. Am I allowed to share new ideas and strategies? And then there's different types of anxieties involved. So I, I think um, I, I agree, I worry that there isn't access. And even if there's attempts to, there's so many barriers um, to, to getting it. Neil, if, if you don't mind my, my jumping in there, because Danielle brings up uh, quite a few really interesting points. It, 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 let's, it, let's go back, uh, you know, several years, but new federal legislation, No Child Left Behind Act gets passed, right? And if, if, if any of you were in the business at that time, you know that the federal government basically said, if you're going to use any of our money to implement programs, it has to be a program that's based on the gold standard of, of research. And they put together this website you could go to that had research in all the different areas where they reviewed textbooks and curriculum programs and things of that nature. And for years, and I would bet that even today, if you go out to the, those sites, half of the half of the publishers weren't even on there, right? And, and some of the programs now that have turned into, um, so recently, and, and Danielle probably knows this, there's this huge debate, the science of reading, right? Multi-century approaches to early literacy, which include the Orton-Gillingham approach. Um, if you go out to the federal website and look for uh, programs that have been vetted by that gold standard of research, you don't find some of the programs that are the most broadly used programs in the country in public school districts. So. This is an example of where schools and, and teachers do have access, but that access is so limited that it really doesn't give you what, what the, true, the true picture is. And so again, it kind of forces you back into, well, if, uh, okay, I'm gonna Google it. And this is, and again, I ramble, my apologies. I've been, I've been sent so many times in the last three years, uh, information on the science of reading that turns out to be where NPR did an in-depth kind of study into um, the science of reading and, and multi-century approaches to early literacy. That's not research, right? That's a journalist's perspective based on talking to a handful of people, but yet I believe that there are schools and districts making decisions about programs based on what amounts to journalism, um, and which is, is really um, difficult for me to stomach uh, uh, sometimes. Uh, because again, we should be making decisions based on what the actual research says, but we don't get direct access to the research. We get access to a journalist's interpretation of the research. This is really this is really interesting to hear the examples you're all putting forward sort of about the long tail of what happens after the, you know, kind of formal training or time spent in academia. Um, and I know in libraries, we we also we just had a really kind of nice conversation around this in our library student advisory board here at OU recently about access after graduation and sort of what essentially amounts to lifelong scalable information literacy skills, as well as some go to tactics for, you know, things like interlibrary loan through public library or statewide networks, which we have, you know, pretty vital uh, crop of here in Ohio, ways that you can get your hands on some information. It isn't perfect by any means. It's nothing is as um, abundant and rich as what you get when you are given access behind that paywall, but I think lots of opportunities um, on the library side as well to help work with you all um, to, to to develop those lifelong skills uh, with with students and um, and others. Uh, so for the next question, we're going to shift gears a little bit to talk a little bit about um, practice and impact on practice. So 
healthcare workers and, and teachers and other practitioners continue to require access to the latest research, as we've been talking about, long after they've left academia in order to remain current um, in their field. And as I mentioned earlier, I think there's even expectations around accreditation and continuing ed that um, tie into that. So what are some of the expectations on practitioners in your fields related to maintaining some standard of evidence-based practice? Um, and you know, any examples you want to provide about how lack of, it, lack of access to the kinds of things we've been talking about here um, plays into that? So maybe here, Evan, I'll start uh, with you on this question. OK, um, well, I think for lack of access, so I teach a lot of the social welfare policy courses um, and we talk about policy as a tool to help advocate. And so if we understand the law, we understand the policies, then we can better help serve individuals by making sure they're getting the things that they deserve and that we're meeting ethical standards um, and things like that. So I think that the first thing I think about is when practitioners have access to research, then we can better hold them accountable for things. Um, and so for them, for staying up on the literature base and the newest evidence and making sure that the practices that they're um, uh, doing are in line with um, current research, that they can better advocate for better treatments, um, better just be informed in order to be a whistleblower if need be. Um, so I think I talk a lot in my classes about the importance of really understanding what research is saying and understanding how to read it and interpret the methods. Um, just as a quick example, I was a school social worker right before I took this job and um, we had this organization that came in and wanted to do this program with our students. They'd gotten all this funding um, and they were ready to launch it. And for some reason, um, because I was on the student services team, I got to be a part of just the conversation about the rollout. Um, and I was asking about this program and I was like, can I see the research on it? And they gave me all the research. They're like, yes, it's an evidence based practice and blah, blah, blah. I read all the research that the organization itself that created the program provided and none of the research said it was effective. And it was if you read it, nothing said it was effective. And so I don't know where this notion was, how they got some information out there to say it's evidence based just because you've done studies doesn't mean that it's evidence based. You have evidence that it's not effective. Um, but I spent a long time reading it and then having to explain it to my colleagues and my bosses about how this is not effective based on what all the research says. And that if we do this program, we have vulnerable students already that it's going to look like they're not trying when we're rolling out this program because it's going to be unsuccessful. And so if we have people that are already vulnerable, we're going to make them feel worse or look worse or somebody within our organization or with that other organization is probably going to say, well, it's this program is supposed to work. And since it's not working, it's got to be you. And so I talk to students a lot about the importance of being able to really understand what's going on. And so understanding and being critical of even the programs that you're doing at work, look them up. Like I really press upon them to make sure that what you're doing in your organization is actually ethical and it's evidence based and it's appropriate because if you are knowingly harming people like that goes against what we're doing as social workers. And so if you're not sure you need to find out and you can't trust that somebody ahead of you or somebody higher in the organization has looked at it, you need to be responsible for yourself and understand that all the clients that are coming in your organization um, are your responsibility in that way. And so you just don't have an option. Um, and when we talk about licensure and that you can lose your license and if you've invested all this years, if I have an MSW, I, I got my BSW, I got my MSW, I've taken all these tests, I've got this license. If I lose that license, that could be a whole career that's lost and I may not be able to be a social worker anymore. So where do I, my whole education then is different. So we can't, we can't take these things lightly. Um, and so I feel like having access to it just really allows, if that information's out there, it really allows them to, to do the jobs that we're trying to teach them to do and, and that they can be held accountable and responsible for protecting all of those clients. Thank you. Danielle. Yeah, so I'll let, when Dr. Gibbs goes, I'll let him speak more broadly to education and I'll kind of narrow in specific, specifically in special education, which is where I do most of my work. Um, but before I lose the train of thought, I might misquote you, Evan, but you said something along the lines of, you know, this is supposed to work 
And if it doesn't, that's on you kind of thing. And I think there's a similar misconception in education, but it's kind of like, this is supposed to work. And if it doesn't, that's on the student, right? And I think there's a lot of blame put in our field that, oh, well, I did this evidence-based practice or I did this intervention and it didn't work. So this is a challenging student or this is whatever. And they're whatever horrible deficit framing we can put there, right? Um, and I think that's really important. I appreciate that you brought that up because just knowing about and maybe trying a practice in a way that you think might be good doesn't make it evidence-based, right? Um, and even just trying something once, right? We know that things that are proven to be evidence-based are consistent over time with different populations or really targeted populations. And so thinking about, well, how are you using it the way it's been researched and either generalized or not, and then performing it to that same standard, right? Um, in special education specifically, there is there are such high standards of using evidence-based practices. Um, going back to some of the things that Tom was saying earlier is like, you know, it's in legislation. Um, teachers are expected to, at this point, use evidence-based practices. And in special education, this is included in parts of writing and developing IEPs, evaluating students, um, using different types of observation protocols, um, all types of different things, collecting and monitoring data, let alone putting in place interventions and teaching strategies that are evidence-based. Um, we hold special educators to specific, actually, categories of evidence-based practices um, and use high leverage high leverage practices that we need to ensure they're using and using correctly in the classroom to support students. Um, so there's a huge expectation, but like we keep saying, there is that disconnect between accessing it and then knowing how to use it and knowing how to do it. So not even access to getting the article or whatever it is, but then also well, just reading one article isn't going to make me masterful in implementing it. So then how do I get more resources or have access to more and more? How do I have access to someone observing me doing it and seeing if I'm doing it with fidelity, right? And implementing this. And so that, that there's that also piece that where's the training and where's the access to the skill set for this um, instead of just knowing about it and for lack of a better word, winging it, right? And then we know kind of like Evan was saying, we could be doing a really huge disservice to students and to schools when we follow through with things like that, when we think we have good intentions, but again, the impact of it can be really harmful. And Tom, how, uh, what are your thoughts here on what, what it looks like at evidence-based practice within your field? I have so many. Dr. Feeney and Dr. Harris, are, I, I'd like to take a class from each of you because just, <laughs> just listening to you talk about your work, uh, Evan, the, the, the example you used being a, a school social worker, we had an experience recently where um, another local government official went to a workshop or a training. They talked about a program that was a, a drug intervention program without ever consulting a single school district, they went out and bought the entire program, spent tens of thousands of dollars, and then put on the political pressure to say, we're in rural Southeast Ohio, the opioid epidemic, you have to implement this. So we tried to play along, did the training. During the training, these questions just kept coming up. And so I asked for the research base behind it. Fortunately, they shared some of the actual articles. Well, it turned out that it had been studied, the program had been created and implemented in another country where apparently they don't have the Federal Educational Rights and Privacy Act, firstly, and secondly, they must ha not have any requirement for professional educators for mandated reporters. Um, because the whole, the, the whole concept was based on um, creating uh, uh, spaces for students to talk openly about their life experiences and risks that they take, et cetera, and having to assure the student that whatever they said was between you and them. What anyone listening to this probably knows in the United States, no public school employee is allowed to do that, right? I mean, you, if, if a child reports to you that they're doing something dangerous, if they're, you have to report that. And so 
but again, that's a that's an example where in the field, I can tell you there were other districts that didn't ask the questions and they're implementing the program. I have no idea what the effect will be. I have no idea, I, hopefully nothing negative will happen, uh, but we refuse to, to implement the program based on having access to that research, reviewing that research and getting a better understanding of, of you know, what the, the barriers were to implementing it in our context. Um, uh, Danielle, and listening to, to what you had to say, I thought about the, so think about the number of public educators that are in, you know, I'll say my age range. So we'll say 35 to, to 55 um, who potentially went to school and were taught reading from a whole language approach. They went to college and learned how to teach reading from a whole language approach. I, I have an elementary ed certification. I never took a sing, single phonics class at all, ever. 10 years ago, the state of Ohio, maybe further back than that, implements the third grade re reading guarantee. Teachers who are teaching uh, reading intervention have to get a special reading endorsement. I, we have, there are hundreds of educators Southeast Ohio got those reading endorsements, many of them from Ohio University or other public universities. Nothing in those requirements, just that, that close in our history, required a phonics course. Today, that's all you hear. Science of reading, phonics, the research says X. How do you not know this? This is this is what's said to us as public educators. How do you not know this? So you, you run into this, um, you run into this uh, in, in your professional life where it's the research you were taught, that research base has changed or the competing, um, the competing thought on that, uh, the research has become more rigorous and the depth of that research is such that now kind of the, uh, the, the opinion has changed, right, in the research field. And again, what we get is uh, legislation that requires us to change what we're doing, uh, sometimes with little or no explanation. Um, and it's, it is it is problematic, and and so I know we're talking about open access, and I'm kind of all over the place with this, but it it, it is amazing to me that we constantly expect public educators, we constantly expect social workers, people who are working with children and families on a daily basis, to use research based practice. All of us have master's degrees, have. Uh, you know, go to, to multiple professional development opportunities throughout the year, have to take PD to get our licenses renewed. And oftentimes those trainings, what's offered to us, what we see conflict maybe with what, um, with what we're told otherwise should be the direction we're, we're headed. So um, there is a lot of conflict out there around, around this from a practitioner perspective. And I, I know Neil, I got a little off task, didn't exactly answer your question, but. No, that's that's quite all right. I, I love where you all um, went in your responses to this question because it really it took us beyond the prominent access issue that we've been talking about a lot of the first part to really how this plays out in practice um, and even at the field level and how earlier to borrow Tom's term, you know, how sort of habits of practice can really get baked in, you know, at that field level as well and, and that, um, you know, research and um, examining research and examining the evidence are not cursory things. It's it's it takes a deep dive. It takes iterations over time and you kind of and you have to keep doing it. So really wonderful to hear the examples of how those tensions are playing out in your fields. Um, about two more questions I think we'll do here and then we'll open it up to see uh, what kinds of questions everyone else has. So the next one is about um, publishing and we talked a little bit about this at the beginning, but practitioners of course are often creators of critical and original research. What barriers or challenges do professionals in your field face in deciding whether to publish their own work, open access or in more traditional journal formats? Um, Danielle, would you like to take the first Thoughts on this? Sure. Um, I would say there's a um, it for me. There's quite a few considerations, and 
one of the first on the positive side is visibility, right? If you want to provide that access, especially to practitioners, you want to look at open access. You want to look at who your work is visible to, who's getting access to that and able to use it and implement it. Um, through traditional formats and traditional journals, that's much harder, right? Because not only does a subscription to the journal cost a lot, but even just one article to pay for it often is pricey and many times pricier than getting a whole, whole book about the same thing, right? And so um, that's one thing is who really does have access to this? Um, and what is my purpose in doing this? To go way back to the first question and thinking about values, am I really here just to limit it to researchers who likely already know similar things? <laughs> or am I here to really get it out into the field um, and to have, in my case, teachers and districts start using this information and implementing it and um, taking it from there? Because they're really the ones doing the legwork on all of it, right? We look into it as researchers. Um, but we can't do that without the teachers. We, we need their classrooms, the students. Um, and so really, who, where do my values lay and who do I want to make this visible to based off of that? Um, I talked earlier about the prestige and the quality behind different types. So that obviously plays a role depending on what my own personal goals are. Um, and then another one that I think, I think it was you, Neil, who brought it up is cost. Um, publishing in some open access journals can cost thousands of dollars. Um, and so immediately that's a deterrent saying, OK, wait, <laughs> I only get so much funding to do so many different things, if any. Right. Um, and then so what are my own barriers to having, I guess, the access to open access? Um, and how do I consider that in moving forward with publication? Thank you, uh, Evan. Yeah, I mean, I think for faculty, I think a lot of it again is back to promotion and tenure. Um, and so if the promotion and tenure document says that you need to have this many publications within nationally recognized journals, um, then you're in that position that even if a nationally recognized journal allows you to publish open access, then like Danielle was saying, then that's the couple thousand dollars that you need to pay. If our university will give you maybe $600. And um, in some situations, if you are you can sort of share that cost if you have multiple um, authors on a journal. But again, for PNT, sometimes you need to be the first author or the solo author to get a promotion and tenure. So you're in that situation that do I keep my job or do I excel in my job or do I do this thing that maybe I care a lot about? Um, and it, this aligns with my personal and professional values. So I think that there are for sure um, disconnects there about what's in the PT document. Um, and I know for myself, like I said, I prefer to just publish in gold OA journals, so journals that are always open access regardless, and not that I'm paying that additional fee. Um, but I think that paying that additional fee gives me that option to, to try to do both. But then I'm in that position of where do I actually get this money um, to make that happen? And if we're, if you're an assistant faculty member somewhere, you're probably not making that much money to spend a couple grand on uh, publishing an article. So um, I think it sort of puts people in that position about really about keeping their job and being able to do well or be promoted within their job. Thanks. Tom, thoughts on this one? I think the overwhelming majority of people who work in pre-K to 12 public education are so tired <laughs> from their 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 day to day work that they just don't even think about publishing, um, even if they're doing action research or even if they're doing, you know, um, I, I think the exception to that would be if there's a relationship with a local university and maybe they're a co-author on on something that's, you know, that's occurring. I know that we've done um, we've had some co-authoring opportunities with Ohio University with our uh, partnership programs and in, in early learning. Um, but uh, Generally speaking, unless somebody has a longer term goal of going into higher ed, uh, needing that that those publishing opportunities to, to get a, a position and to work towards tenure. Um, there's just so much time both during the work day and outside of work of the actual just job of of working with children and families that it's just not a common practice. Gotcha, thanks, yeah. Um, I really loved hearing about keeping the values foregrounded in making these 
decisions. I think that's a piece of the conversation that I don't hear enough about. Um, you know, when people are talking about OA, but just from the library um, side of things in terms of making those publication decisions and the real trade offs that that means if one decides that the cost or the need to really uh, all the practical considerations that go along with advancing your own career and life, you know, there are, there are real trade offs to really think through there um, when weighing these decisions. So thank you all. Um, I think throughout the top of the hour here, I'm going to bring us to our, our final question um, for the panel here today, uh, which is so if we're if we acknowledge that and I think we all have uh, throughout the conversation that open access is a valuable component of a practitioner's continuing ed, um, how can OA be OA publishing be encouraged both within academia and by those working outside in the field. And another little dimension to this that I'll tack on here is if you all work with students in different ways and, and you know, what opportunities do you see to to um, work with students to get a better understanding of what either lifelong info literacy or, you know, openly sharing research um, means? Uh, I'll start with Tom on this one. Yeah, I mean, I guess in a perfect world, um, I, I just uh, listening to Evan and Danielle speak, they've they've mentioned a couple of uh, of uh, places online that uh, ResearchGate. I mean, again, I've been in the field a long time. I have not heard of ResearchGate. My guess is most public educators haven't. So I, I think there's going to have to be, in order to to make uh, uh, whatever's kind of built over time uh, uh, more accessible. Access begins with with uh, uh, knowledge that. That the information's out there and available, right? And and so that people can start to build uh, that use of those those tools into their practice. Um, so I think it's it it'll take a little bit of kind of re-engineering um, how we do our work uh, as practitioners, um, just having that information available to us. Thank you. Sorry, I lost my cursor there for a second <laughs> to unmute myself. Thank you, Tom. Uh, Evan. How about you? Yeah, I mean, I think that part of it is, I, I mean, I know when I was getting my PhD and having conversations where people, we, I went to a university where our school of social work actually had their own social work journal or uh, OA journal. Um, so I had known always that that was a thing that was kind of going around. I don't think I really understood the significance until um, somebody broke down like Elsevier and all of the different things that they own and how they're ruining the world. But um, I think that if, if people had a better understanding of that, and I feel like even with my colleagues, I talk about like, do you understand that we do their research for free and we are capitalizing off of somebody else's free labor to participate in this stuff. We then give it away to free for free to publishers that then sell it back to our libraries so we can have access to it. It's like the system doesn't make any sense and people are making a bunch of money on it, but not the people that anybody wants to make a bunch of money on it. And the fact that we're hurting our libraries in that process of then driving their sort of budgets up higher and higher or they're making decisions about which journals we can have and not because the publishers are making their prices higher and higher. Um, so I think some just general under, um, education about how the system works um, and how the system then continues to harm everybody that we want to serve. So even it doesn't really benefit researchers. It for sure doesn't benefit any of the clients that we hope. It doesn't benefit any of our practitioners. Um, and so I think if there's that general understanding that people get what the system is about, because I think people think that researchers get paid um, to do it and the majority of us don't. Um, and so I think that there's just a lack of information. So I think if we did more to sort of explain that, um, and if we did more to sort of support the OA journals that are out there and to publish in them, I, I want to publish in gold a OA journals, not because I think that my stuff is not good enough to go somewhere else, but because that's how we get it started. That's how we're supporting that system and that's how we're changing it, is that we have to intentionally go there first um, and put good work in journals that people think are bad, but they're not, they're just free. Um, and I think sometimes if it's if we think if we equate cost with value, I think we can kind of get a little bit confused and twisted about what what's important. Um, and so I think it's it's more so about explaining how the system works and educating people about that. And just because it's free doesn't mean it's it's bad. It just means that maybe somebody was really intentional when they decided to put their work there. I think you're absolutely right. Although that also raises for me the issue of pred predatory journals, um, which are 
course, bad and have some, you know, and there's real opportunities there to add that into the mix and the kinds of um, educational efforts that you're talking about. Danielle, Sorry. you get the, yeah, you get the last word on this one. Okay, pressure. <laughs> um, my answer, unfortunately, is not as tangible as those that were already mentioned, but um, I think my answer to this is really just that we have to reassess our values and just keep going back to that value conversation. Um, why are we in this work? What is our goal here? And are we really here for practicing teachers and to support students in pre-K through 12 and call it whatever it is? Why are we here? Why did we choose this path? What is our mission? Um, and I think um, Evan mentioned it at the very beginning, even I think it was in your intro, maybe. Um, but also, if we really do have this focus on equity, and we really do want to be thinking about how what we are doing is equitable to everyone across the board, and how we are um, not perpetuating harm or barriers or whatever it is, um, we really need to reassess. And I think that's a huge thing to take on as a whole field or just academia at large. But to make it more tangible, I'm wondering if those are conversations that we start in our departments in higher ed or whatever. What are the guidelines and expectations for promotion? Why are, why are they these things? How do we change them to align with what our values are or should be, right? And so I wonder if it's taking those conversations to really make sure that we are aligning, not just that we are in this work to be prestigious and to, to actually limit access to people, but why are we here? Why are we doing this? And then how does our trajectory align with all of those things? I can't think of a better way to round out the conversation than with values, Danielle. So thank you so much. Um, so we have time now for some questions and I see we already have a hand up. Uh, Kelly, go ahead. Yeah, I started this question thinking about this question while Evan was talking and then Danny read you went right into it. So I really want to know uh, what strategies can we use in academia specifically if you have suggestions of what strategies could libraries or librarians use to encourage and promote faculty discussion around pros and cons of open access in their department's values and priorities regarding PNT. Not an I mean, easy question. No, <laughs> I think so. I think even within this, uh, within the department of social work, I think that we're talking more about this. Um, but in our PNT, fortunately, doesn't have a lot of restrictions in it um, already because I think it has some social work values kind of built in. So we don't have a lot of concrete examples, which can also be a con because it's hard to understand when you've achieved it. Um, but I think in general, if we're talking about pre-tenure folks, I feel like generally you're really kind of scared or like already sort of trying to walk the tightrope to keep your job. You're not really sure what the expectations are. Um, so I think it's hard for those folks to say something. And so I think it has to come down from those already tenured folks or just the senior sort of folks within those departments um, to sort of say that this is OK um, and then that we really support this. And I think if you have a conversation based on values, um, it seems hard to reconcile that with publishing for numbers, but even in a social work program that I've been in, understanding that if the dean of that program says that we really want to move up in the rankings and this is what it's going to cost for us to move up in the rankings, um, the system that then we're playing into sort of kind of pushes us to um, publish in higher tier journals. Um, so I think that the system is so interconnected that it's, it's it, I think it would be hard to really say that people can just flip it um, because it's getting money to have a program to be able to even keep your faculty uh, there if your students sort of drop off because you dropped you drop down in the rankings then that's a, a real implication to people's livelihoods um, so i wish it could be a real straightforward answer but i think because of the way the connection is um, we have to talk about values and stuff but 
if the rankings are going to be what they are and if people are going to pick schools based on rankings, it's it does often come down to a business decision, which I think is disgusting, but I understand that it's uh, the reality of us also having jobs and me be able to, you know, take care of my family and stuff. So I think it's a really tough, that doesn't help Kelly, <laughs> <I know. laughs> but I think it's tough. Yeah, I was going to say, I don't think I have anything that's any more helpful than that because it is, it's a systems issue and we know that individuals can't change systems, right? It takes a lot more work than that. Um, and one thing I'm, I'm, I immediately was thinking of was, well, we definitely have committees. I mean, I can only speak to patent college of education, but we have committees that are focused on promotion and tenure and things like that. And so I was wondering, first of all, if, oh, can you be in contact with these committees and share some of this information, talk to them? Why do they have these requirements or what requirements do they have and why? Um, but like I've been saying, that wouldn't do enough systemically. Um, so then how do we be in contact with other libraries across universities, especially at similar rankings? And there's so much to it um, that I think it's it's really insurmountable. But I do I do wonder if those types of little actions will cause the ripple effect, hopefully, right? And we can only do so much so often um, until we can get more people on board to cause a greater ripple. Um, I also wonder if there would be benefits in doing things like making brochures or pamphlets about those many misconceptions that Evan had brought up about, you know, this is often viewed as bad because it's free or people think this about it or whatever. And I wonder if that information um, is not widely available even to faculty who are doing the work. Um, and that that might be one way to also start is, hey, let's dive into the truth and the fact and um, let's address or debunk some misconceptions and send that out to see if that even sparks a conversation amongst faculty or committees or programs um, to, to discuss it. I wonder if that would also be one little ripple that could be made. I, I will just say that I would I would love to um, foster an institutional conversation around open open access, open research, open data, et cetera. Really, because as you all know, I mean, certain institutions do have institutional statements and a stance on it, which this one does not. Um, but I think it's a combination of sort of high level dialogue as well as things happening in departments and 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 elsewhere that that starts to cause those ripples, as you say, Daniel. Um, I'm also Tom, I, you know, curious as you know from our conversation, you know, I, I'm trying to um, ensure that the libraries can help foster community conversations as well, wherever it can. And so I'm wondering if you had any thoughts kind of building off of Kelly's question about um, what opportunities there might be, do you think, um, to have sort of community conversations around information access or maybe how this plays out with, within the school district? Any, any thoughts there of how we can be of help in furthering that? You know, I, very good question. I do, I, I, uh, I do want to circle back though to, to, to Evan and Danielle's really quick, and that is, uh, I think the other complexity that gets added to, the, to this whole mix is, is that um, oftentimes your your youngest faculty members also they may not be intending to stay at your university for their entire career, so they they also have to be thinking, looking through the lens of what are going to be the expectations if I want to go to X university and work in the, in the future, right? Um, so it does have to be a really a system wide uh, system wide conversation. Um, I think, you know, reflecting back on a, a Neil and I had had coffee a year ago or so and, and had a really long conversation about this this exact topic. And just talking about how university libraries in particular in, in, in uh, communities like this can can create programming and be uh, more welcoming of people in the broader community just uh, coming in using the library resources and uh, and and having access in that manner. Um, and I do think it's really it's really important um, and and I don't. I don't know what the answer is because I do know that having lived on the Near East side of Athens for the time that my daughter was in elementary school, she and I would walk to the the library and uh, and would um, you know there's a nice children's book sec section there on the the main floor, the fourth floor, I think it is, 
and uh, we would access that, and we would we would go and look at the the uh, the uh, Asian collection that you have. Uh, I don't know, second or third floor. Um, introduced her to the concept of microfiche and how that all you know that whole section of the library. So those are things that uh, just getting her interested in this kind of um, uh, a, a different way of looking at at things than what you get in a just a typical school experience. Um, and I don't know if I'm really answering your question, but I, I I don't think that most even public universities kind of broadcast that people from the general community are allowed to just walk in the library and take a look around and see what there is to offer and to just randomly, you know, pick up some some uh, a, a, a book or a research journal and and peruse. Um, and so I I do think it could be really valuable um, to make university libraries because university libraries are different than a typical public library, right? I think it would I think it'd be a, a an interesting cultural change uh, to make access to university libraries uh, just more open to the general public. Thanks for that. Yeah, and, and certainly it was a it was an aspect of of coming to this institution and this position that was really appealing to me is the openness of this library and its connections to the community, which had not been something I'd experienced in other places where I'd worked uh, quite as quite as deeply. Um, other so other thoughts or questions for our panelists today. Or any emergent questions that any of you had for each other as we've been talking through the conversation. I mean, I guess I feel like I want to uh, add a little bit more because I do feel like our response was pretty negative uh, to Kelly's question. <laughs> <laughs> but I do think I do think that there is like authentically a lack of information and I don't think so even when I think about when we go through PhD programs what we're taught to do within those PhD programs so I think that even once you get a job and you understand like I was taught that I'm supposed to continue to strive and climb that ladder to Tom's point that if I'm at a, a um, an R2 school, then I should want to end up in an R1 school and I'm going to continue to do that and try to apply. And I think that that's something that we're sort of taught in school to keep kind of striving. And so I think that um, the idea of finding a fit and to be able to publish based on your values and things like that, I don't know that we actually know that that's an option that we have um, because I think we're taught a way. So I think if there is just general education to say that these are the options that are out there, this is what that means and understand how the system, I think if there is education then people will sort of come but I also know that our school our college then created a new grant that says that you can get funding that if you are going to publish in a journal that's not an open access journal but to pay those open access fees or one that is just an open access journal that has an open access fee so then we have different grant options um, so you can go different pathways and try to get your needs met but still have an open access publishing. Thanks for that, Evan. And, and I didn't hear the initial discussion is very negative, to be honest. I, it's it is a it is the definition of, as um, Danielle said, a systems issue, and it's a really sticky issue, not only with kind of the grinding uh, wheels of academia, but, you know, publishing and libraries and, you know, there are really important diversity and, in, and inclusion aspects to the whole open access conversation, especially as it relates to nations in the global south um, who are often seen as more as consumers of research and less actual active uh, participants in it. And they often are not able to avail themselves of some of the OA deals that are struck. Lots and lots of dimensions of this that I think all come back to values. Um, so. And I see in the chat, uh, Nicole saying that OA inf information and discussion should be intentionally incorporated into doctoral programs. Yeah. Pause here to see if there's any more questions. Well, Neon, I would agree with Nic Nicole on that. Um, you know, I, I just finished my doctoral program, as did my, my wife in 2015, which is not that long ago in the grand scheme of things, right? open access wasn't really much of a conversation. The, the conversation was was more open in regards to publishing in online uh, journals, which is, you know, most open, well, I think pretty much all open access is on online, right? Um, what I think the other part of it too is, is that that um, it, 
it does speed up the process of getting information to people, right? And and so if you're also talking about wanting to get practitioners to publish more, back in the day when you had to, you know, draft something and then you send it to a, a, a publication, it could be months before you ever even got a, a letter back, right? Um, and so the the one advantage to OA from a practitioner perspective is is that um, it does it it kind of it abbreviates that time and it allows for a quicker turnaround and that is more encouraging for a practitioner uh, than that those long wait times that that exist with a traditional publication. Indeed, yeah. The um, you know, in the spirit of a lot of funding agencies also making open access and open data part of their requirements for funded research, you know, is also in that spirit of getting the um, outputs of research into the hands of people and practitioners and other researchers more quickly is just really, you know, good all around. Uh, some more, Chris put another helpful link for some OA um, information from the libraries in the chat. I'm also going to just uh, post a link to the Ohio Open Library, which is an institutional repository for open materials that we host here in the library. So if faculty or other researchers have um, open versions of articles, um, you can certainly reach out to us about hosting it there. Create a space here to see if there's any final questions for our panel. Uh, Neil, is that open uh, open library? Is, can I share that with my faculty? And that uh, link? You could certainly share it, yes. Uh, in terms of who can deposit into it, I believe you do have to affiliate it with OU to actually put something in there, but one of my colleagues can correct me um, if I'm wrong on that. But absolutely, it is open, completely open to the public, whatever is in there um, for people to utilize and access. Uh, <laughs> Any chance Dr. Gibbs will be open publishing his snow day poetry? I've heard about that poetry, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> I I actually, uh, um, Joseph, I, I actually joked that I was going to write a book of poetry uh, for superintendents about how to give people uh, bad news uh, using poetry. So I would start with snow days because that's difficult for some, you know, some people to get child care, that kind of thing. So it adds a little bit of levity to it. But, you know, like, how to give someone a poor evaluation with poetry, uh, how to how to write a student up or suspend them from school with poetry. So who knows, I might I might do something uh, uh, clever like that someday, just for fun. I, I would encourage that. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, Jen and Jen is suggesting perhaps an authors at Alden event for you at some point, Tom, when you when you publish that. Think about the OU Press too. We have the director of the OU Press with us today. Maybe, a, maybe that could be a venue for it. Um, thank you. Anyway, thank you. So if we have no other questions, I am going to uh, once again extend my sincere thanks to Tom, Evan, and Danielle for, for sharing their time and their perspectives with us this afternoon. Um, I also want to thank uh, Dr. Chris Guter and John Cantor from the libraries for conceptualizing and organizing this event today, to Jen Harvey, our events coordinator, for organizing us and helping with the promotion, uh, and to Morgan Spayar, Brooke Stanley, and Kate Mason for the publicity for today's event. Um, it's really been a pleasure to spend time with you all this afternoon uh, and to talk through this. Um, I'm hoping that we can continue the conversation conversations in various ways moving forward. Thank you all very much to everybody who came out today um, in the audience and uh, look forward to uh, talking to you all soon.